This video is preparation for part 3 of my Bluebell set, which will be about its mycorrhizal symbiosis. So, we'll call this video part 3a, Introducing Symbiosis. It will not be a textbook definition, but rather my own appraisal of how different creatures live together in pairs, trios, quartets, right up to the community level. Whether we look at a single plant or whole communities of plants, for instance woodland, what do we see? With our eyes we see a plant or lots of plants and maybe that's about it. What could we see if we allowed our brain to synthesise in imagination, in detail, a pieced together multidimensional image of each individual plant above ground and below ground, alone and also as part of the whole interactive community consisting of plants, fungi, bacteria, animals and so on. Given time and information, that sort of profound understanding can be achieved, but never completely. At our present point in the constantly improving enlightenment of Homo sapiens, we know an awful lot, much more than every generation of our ancestors. But whether we will ever know everything is doubtful. That is not a deficiency to give us fear or regret, but a welcome challenge automatically provided by our innate human curiosity, which because of the natural world's intricate complexity, is an endless quest we can pursue and appreciate and enjoy. There's so much we can gain from learning about what's going on beyond our ordinary senses, looking elsewhere for information that will enable us to understand and value our surroundings. One major feature of ecological communities is symbiosis. All but the most primitive of organisms are symbioses, all manner of species collaborations, any of which we might consider to be a community in itself. Humans, for instance, are the body we see, plus our gut community of bacteria and single-celled creatures, the protists, and the mitochondria in each cell that once were bacteria that took up residence in other bacteria long before multicellularity had evolved. Then there's all that lives on our skin, in our various orifices, and so on. Symbiosis is simply everywhere, here in fast-flowing rivers where salmon breed, Freshwater pearl mussels depend entirely on salmon reproduction to facilitate their own. No salmon, no pearl mussels. What is symbiosis? Briefly, symbiosis consists of two or more organisms living together with at least one of them gaining some benefit. Thanks to symbiosis, some fungi can grow on the most unlikely substrates if they collaborate with another organism, in this case a cyanobacterium, which can manufacture and share carbohydrate which the fungus, in this form known as a lichen, is unable to obtain unaided. The fungus provides somewhere for its partner to live, as well as being able to gather nutrients to share, supplies of which on a road sign are likely to be scarce, but nonetheless just sufficient. As demonstrated on the road sign, lichens are great ecological pioneers, here exploiting an inhospitable rock surface on which plants may grow later, just as the moss is doing. A similar process occurs on tree bark. Here the pioneer lichens are wafer thin, and here taken over by a folios lichen, moss and liverwort community. In lichens the benefits of symbiosis tend to be mutualistic. We, observers of nature, have applied the term parasitism to relationships that could be, if judged less harshly, fairly be termed symbiosis, such as this honey fungus and its birch tree victim, which it will kill and eat. But no matter how cruel, parasites do not eliminate populations of their victims, many of which survive unaffected, and the communities in which they live benefit from the ecological controls that parasitism provides. Others may disagree, but I count parasitism as symbiosis, beneficial at the community and habitat level. Here, to its benefit, the parasitic barnacle Sacculina has prevented this female crab from molting, enabling it to feed on its unfortunate host until it's done with her, while the opportunistic barnacles, because they won't be sloughed off during a routine molt, have the opportunity to remain on the crab's carapace and multiply. Symbiosis consists of at least five escalating functions. 1. Interaction, living together. 
2. Interdependence, partnership. 3. Iteration, repetition. 4. Intricacy, multiplicity and interweaving, and then the marvellous emergence of the complex communities we call ecosystems. In this example, a lion's mane jellyfish, travelling upside down, provides a protective environment for a shoal of little fishes, safe from predators among its stinging tentacles. The relationship may seem simple, but it is a mere component in the infinite complexity of the marine environment. Interaction. Living together. Here is a lichen, but not as we know it. These little mushrooms belong to a fungus that lives in sphagnum tussocks, but is sharing its lifestyle with a single-celled green alga growing unseen on and in the moss. Here's another very familiar example of symbiotic interaction. Interdependence. Once a symbiotic relationship has become established, there is usually interdependence built into the system, with benefit accrued by both partners, but that's why symbioses evolved. Here, in a modern botanical setting, bluebell roots are packed with the fungus, Scutula spora diperperescens, which provides phosphate scavenged from soil in exchange for carbohydrate the plant manufactures from photosynthesis. Neither can perform the other's nutritional function. Neither can thrive without the other. Interdependence. This is a form of mutualism. See part three of my Bluebell videos. Iteration. Repeat, 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 etc. A good idea will evolve by repetition as well as by change. In the spring, ants feed on the sugary secretions of nectaries, green pads by the joints on bracken stalks. Early in their evolution, ferns and ants began to cooperate, and now, by iteration of the idea, many ants and plants do, while the relationship has diversified. Intricacy. Symbioses interwoven with others in intriguing but quite complicated combinations. The Indian pipe is a flowering plant with no chlorophyll, so it cannot produce its own carbohydrate as most other plants do. It forms a three-way partnership below ground with forest trees and their mycorrhizal fungi. That we call mycoheterotrophy. Here that is explained. This photo montage shows what we might see in an ideal field situation with the tree on the right, the Indian pipe centre and the mushroom of the soil fungus left. In reality they will all be present but aren't necessarily seen together like this. Let's dig down into the soil. The Indian pipe has no more than a cluster of stumpy roots attached to the mycelium of a soil fungus, which in its turn is attached to feeder roots of nearby trees. The fungus and the tree are associated as a mycorrhiza, one function of which is to supply the fungus with carbohydrate manufactured by the tree by photosynthesis. The fungus can't do this, and neither can the Achlorophyllus Indian pipes, so both receive a supply from the tree. Wikipedia and other online advisors may describe this relationship as parasitism, but no, emphatically no. It is a co-evolved cooperation from which all three partners benefit and none is harmed. The non-judgmental term mycoheterotrophy, meaning feeding via a fungus, is much more appropriate. Here is just one more escalation in the intricacy of symbiotic relationships, mixotrophy. Like the pale Achlorophyllus plants, the Monotropa and others, the broad-leaved Helleborine is plugged into a mycorrhiza of adjacent trees, here probably downy birch. But it's green and fully capable of producing its own carbohydrate by photosynthesis. But it grows in the deep shade of woodland, its reliable, tree-donated carbohydrate supply enables it to grow where light and therefore its own photosynthesis are limited. Here are two more British orchids that live in a three-way symbiosis with trees and mycorrhizal fungi. One has chlorophyll and the other does not. By emergence, we are referring to the gradual development of complexity from initial states of simplicity. It is a ubiquitous process, not only in nature, but recognised properly and studied only relatively recently, our understanding of it emerging from the Santa Fe Institute. If we count a one-to-one -one symbiosis as simplicity, 
say, of this mature oak and a root-inhabiting fungus, then complexity emerges as the diversity of fungal species in the roots increases during the lifetime of the tree. Adjacent plants join the local community, many with their own different fungal associates, at least 11 with bluebells alone. And the next generation of trees, seen here surrounding the mother oak, all developing their own communities of root fungi, and so much more going on. <laughs> that was a long and complicated sentence, unashamedly presented to describe a long and extremely complex ecological process. There is an endless supply of symbioses waiting to be discovered and described. Here's a possible candidate. Otters and the juvenile phase of palmate newts, called efts. Otters routinely emerge from the sea to wash their fur in freshwater pools above high water mark. They give away their presence by depositing their spraint in habitual latrine areas, often next to wash pools, which become tussocky and bright green. The water of wash pools can become quite, shall we say, organic, an ideal habitat for microbes, suitable food for efts. So there might be a research project in the question, is there a symbiotic relationship between otters and newts? Now that I've explained symbiosis as best as I can, please open the next video in this series, which is about the bluebell's relationships with soil fungi.